gather round to hear the tale of Donovan Graham. Everyone who knew him thought he was a paladin, but he was not. Everyone who knew him thought he was a noble born, but he was not. Everyone who knew him thought he was a brave man, but he was not. A rogue and a con artist. What began as a simple attempt to get free lodgings at a temple for the night rapidly spiralled into a lie from which Donovan could not escape. That very night, word came that the governor was calling up for a band of brave souls to set forth and attempt to gain intelligence or even slow the advance of an army pushing up from the south. He had beseeched the church to send aid and while there was not one among their elderly ranks who could have endured such a trial, there was their visiting brother Paladin. But I've no armour, no weapons. I donated them all to the poor, Donovan explained. Then take with you these relics, the blade and armour of a great knight entrusted into your care. As one equal to him in both bearing and breeding, we know he would approve of you using them, the monks answered back. And so given a weapon he'd no idea how to use, and clad armour so heavy he could barely stand. Donovan Graham joined a rough band of mercenaries and patriots to face a vast and terrible army. His plan was to run the first chance he got, yet in that first attempt he blundered straight into an enemy spy. In panic and through sheer luck, he put his sword through the man's chest and collapsed below a tree. The rest of the band caught up with him, cheering the brave paladin Donovan for uncovering the spy. So continued his every effort to flee, at least four more times carrying him unwittingly into the clutches of danger and death. The rest of the band were amazed at his abilities the sniff out ambushes and patrols, and the almost berserker-like fervour in which he set upon their foes. Finally, realising that his only chance to survive was to keep the company of others, Donovan ceased attempting to flee. Soon he began to impress them with other skills, such as the setting of traps and snares, being able to talk an entire camp of local bandits into aiding them, and even methods to stealthily approach enemy lines without being seen. It was clear to them that all his religious passion and knightly virtue was tempered with great worldly knowledge. Unanimously it was agreed that he would lead the guerrilla movement against the enemy. Donovan, despite himself, began to grow fond of the member of his band, in particular the young bard with laughing green eyes, who delighted in his knowledge of body songs. I wouldn't think a member of nobility would know that one, Donovan. Are you kidding? We wrote it and the half-elven wizardess with the freckled face, whose worldliness both awed and frightened him. Even the half-orc, as grouchy and unfriendly a man as had ever been born, had somehow become a pillar he relied on. With the aid of bandit clans and the local population, they slowed and even checked the advancing army, as bounty was placed on all their heads, but none was higher than that for the black-haired paladin who led them. Having managed to avoid directly involving himself in the battle nearly every time, legends rose about his great prowess and mastery of the sword, how he could, in a single sweep of his fiery blade, reap through soldiers as if they were wheat. Such rumours awakened the dark hungers of the commanding general of the invaders, whose power and skill was matched only by his ruthlessness. He longed to face the paladin in a duel and prove how mortal his legend was, yet His invitations went unanswered, or else resulted in ambushes that badly weakened his forces. Finally, this man had enough, and set upon a course of action to ensure Donovan would have no choice but to face him. With his most loyal commanders at his side, he stormed into one of the communities that supported the guerrillas. He burnt every house to the ground, and held as hostage every soul in town, threatening to kill them all unless the paladin faced him. A paladin could not have turned his back upon those people. A thief had no such trouble. Donovan spent days avoiding the challenge and the issue, his smooth tongue soothing concerns of his allies. He was able to save face right up until the first headless body was placed upon a stake outside of town. Then the protests became too much to talk of. The cry for action and revenge rose from every corner and Donovan knew there was no more avoiding it, so he decided he would run away. As always though, his luck was poor. As he passed close to the bard, listening as she comforted frightened children with songs about his bravery and nobility, his resolve to flee was not yet broken though. As he moved on, only to run into the wizardess instead. She spoke of her confidence in him, 
She spoke of what defeating the commander would mean, but most of all, she spoke of the life she expected to lead once her war was over. A life that, she had decided, would involve him, just like everything else. He had smiled then, sardonic and sad. I don't even get asked. She had smiled too and held his hand. Some things are just decided for you. They're never your choice to begin with. And then he stayed. Perhaps he came to believe she was right. Perhaps he forgot he had been trying to run away. Perhaps he had bought into his own legends. Perhaps he just knew that the companions whom he loved were looking on. Because despite all wisdom, Donovan went to the occupied town to face his opposite number. The battle was brief and bloody, and to any eye it was clear that the paladin did not have a chance. He was struck down, laying bleeding and immobile on the ground, while his foe raised a bloody sword into the air as his sign of victory, failing to notice, as he did, that Donovan's hand was moving, undoing the straps of his cumbersome armour, leaving to lay his heavy sword. Impossibly, he stood up despite his wounds, clutching in his shaking hand a dagger. He had poisoned himself even before the fight, leaving himself numb to pain. Though his foe's back lay open to him, Donovan waited. Waited just long enough for the villain to turn about. Waited to see the look in the other man's eyes before he drove a dagger straight into one of those same eyes and killed him instantly. By that time, the shocked enemy commander had already been secretly surrounded by the guerrillas and were captured. The hostages were freed. The army was scattered. The flag of the nation once more waved high above the town. Donovan stayed standing just long enough to see it happen, before his body slumped to the ground once more, dead for good this time, either from the poison in his veins or the blood that had spilled out of them. And to this day, St Donovan Graham is honoured as a patron of guerrillas and just causes. Having started as your standard dwarf fortress, the helmet of tyranny was uneventful by normal standards. But sure, there would be caravans and immigrants and occasional, though unusually rare, sieges. But there was a dark and deadly secret buried beneath the hills, and his name was Ashmalus. Ashmalus was a fire demon of legendary status. Not only had he existed in the prehistory of the fort, but he had over 550 kills, which included two entire tribes of goblins, a handful of elves, and a terrifying mount of dwarves one of whom was the king of the mountain homes. Fast forwarding to the present time, major construction was underway of the fort. Many, many immigrants had arrived over the years and times were good for the dwarves. Having many legendary carvers and warriors, my friend grew lax in his defences and his dwarves paid the price when a miner unearthed a glowing pit deep below the dungeons carved into the mountain. Within an hour, my friend's fortress was besieged by a nearly unending horde of demonic horrors, ill-equipped to deal with the threat immediately. The population of Hamlet began dropping exponentially. Not even a panicked redirection of the river into the lower levels was enough to staunch the influx of demons. Only enough to slow them long enough for the major walkways to be collapsed, to buy some precious time. Luckily and cleverly, my friend had built his fortress in such a way that if any large section had collapsed, then all escape routes would lead out into the wilderness and on a path far from the fortress, and defendable by collapsing the ceiling via lever to flood seawater into the tunnel. Though no dwarf was alive on that side of the map, or able to reach it to pull the lever, my friend had bought the dwarves much needed time. Though when Ashmalis made himself known, all seemed futile, even more so when Stuvok lost his mind with rage. Stuvok was one of the Finding Seven. He was an ex-miner turned blacksmith of legendary status. He was a monster of a dwarf that all dwarves aspired to be. And he had just lost his wife, Dokin, another of the starting seven, to the demon Ashmalis. His sorrow was felt by the surviving clan as he tore through them one by one unopposed. Only when he ran into his workshop and was locked in did his rage abate. Morale was rock bottom. Several dwarves committed suicide in this dark hour, and of the handful who remained of this once great fortress, few were willing to do anything at all, except the only other remaining dwarf of the finders, the engraver Sill. In the months that followed, the floors were carved in the graven images of his fellow brethren. All hope seems lost, but this was not the end for the hamlet. 
not just yet. In his grieving and mourning, Stuvok opened his heart to the spirits of the dead, and one day they came to him in spirit. In his possessed mood, he plotted and planned, and ironically, with the materials available to him, crafted an artifact clearly in a homage to his wife. Endless death of tears. A sword with an image of a dwarf holding a piece of glass. Glass that his wife used daily in her trade. My friend had been content just to flood the map with lava and end the game after such losses. But upon seeing this artifact, his neckbeard overtook him and he knew that Dokken, the dwarves, the king, must all be avenged. And thankfully for me, he decided to continue. Fast forwarding again to the present, the time at which I had come in to see him play. My friend had safely excavated what he could off the fortress and moved all activity to a small corner of the interior. When all levers were erected, dwarves armed and preparations complete, he unpaused the game for me. A few dwarves made suicide runs to the bottom of the dungeon and collapsed them, which in turn lowered the debris above into a sinkhole that breached a large hole for the demons to pour from back into the fort. A few more dwarves valiantly fired into the oncoming tide of hate, but they were nothing but fodder that bought precious moments for the true plan to kick in. A masterfully placed lever that had yet been unpulled brought down the entire mountain through the legendary dining hall ceiling, crushing almost half of the intruding horde. As planned, the demons made a beeline through the side hallways through a row of blade traps. Demons were chewed up by the blades, but they still came, and so did he. Ashmalis not only avoided the fatal cave-in, past the slicing blades, and bypassed the numerous flooding trap chambers, but he and a squad of equally lucky frog demons carved and scorched their way into the final defence line. Among their victims was Stuvok, unable to avenge his beloved, and the last handful of dwarves were quickly reduced to two, Sil the engraver and the legendary captain of the guard, Dinkin. As respected and powerful as Stuvok had been, Dinkin was that and more. He was a god among his clan, and had once in his long career single-handedly repelled a goblin siege led by a cyclops, and had helped wrestle a dragon to death. And now armed with his dead friend's artifact sword, he was seeing red. Dinkin had been stationed at the edge of the chasm. My friend's map had a pit and a chasm, that had been unearthed, but it was amazingly only filled with tiny spiders that were easily dispatched in the early years of the fort. A single bridge had been built to span the chasm, and would have been later expanded as housing, but that plan was no longer, and this was it. This was the end of the dwarves of the hamlet of tyranny, but they would not go quietly. Won't go quietly. (laughs) As the demons approached, Dinkin threw himself at them in rage, Ashmalis blasted him with a demonic flame, but Dinkin was imbued with the collective rage of his people and carved through the frog retainers with little signs of stopping. Ashmalis, however, had seen the deaths of a king and was not impressed with the antics of a lowly dwarf and sent him hurtling back into the bridge, coincidentally knocking Sill over the edge. With his flesh scorching and his blood boiling, Dinkin crawled to his feet just in time to see Ashmalis hover over him. With but a single push, the fortress would be claimed by the demons. But to my friends and my own utter jaw-dropping amazement, it was the dwarves who claimed him. Dinkin, in a testament to his dwarfdom, slashed off one of Ashmalis' arms slash wings and plunged endless death of tears into his evil heart. Such was the force of the blow that the demon was hurtled backwards off the bridge and sent spiralling down into the unending darkness, spouting curses the entire way. With his clan and his king avenged, Denkin himself tumbled from the bridge, but one dwarf remained. Awestruck by what just happened, I urged my friend to quickly find the survivor. The menus opened, the tabs clicked, and we see that name, Sill. Sill? But he fell into the chasm. What was going on? With the battle essentially over, and the remaining demons blocked from further intrusion by an unchecked flood of river water. We peered into the chasm, several Z-levels down, on a tiny two-square ledge, lay Sill, broken and bleeding, but alive, with no way to save him, and with his entire clan residing in the afterlife. We debated how this should end. Should we just abandon the fort outright? 
Should we try and kill him somehow? What? In the end, however, we decided to let him create one more carving. One last testament to dwarf kind. His decision did not come lightly. After such an epic climax, anything less would seem an insult. But still we left him to his work. After all, maybe he would draw a picture of a plump helmet or something equally random. What did he draw? Moments before he bled to death, alone on a cliff, the last gesture of dwarves of the Hamlet of Tyranny, a picture of a demon and some dwarves. The demon was in a fetal position. The dwarves were laughing.